Today's youth need teachers, volunteers, and most of all, well, they need you. I'm Doug Edwards, and I'm going to be talking with real youth mentors and students to give you the knowledge you need to be the best youth worker possible. This is Youth Worker on Fire. Hey, Youth Workers, this is Doug Edwards with Youth Worker on Fire, and I am really glad to have a guy who has heard about us, reached out to me, and Tim Brockup. That's the way we say it, Tim, right? You got it. That's, that's it. That's it. That may be the first time someone's pronounced it right the first time. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I called him up and said, how do I pronounce this? So we, we had to work on that. And, uh, and he has been a missionary kid. Uh, he has been a part of several organizations. He's a youth pastor for a period of time. The biggest thing, though, that I found out was that he and I were from the same area in North Carolina. Yeah. He is from Lexington, which is about five or so miles from Thomasville, North Carolina, which is where I grew up. And We uh, got better barbecue, though. You do, let me tell you. <laughs> we went to Lexington Barbecue. We still talk about it when we go home. That's where we eat. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's absolutely right. Part of the uh, Christian Missionary Alliance Church, and you'll have to get into some of that story possibly there. And he has been a part of several things. Grew up in that area, though. Now he's in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania, man, what a place to be historically. Yeah. Uh, is, is it as amazing as people say it is? That's a that's a loaded question, man. I love it here. <laughs> I don't know if everyone else does. Well, if you love it, that means it's an amazing place. You don't have to guess what people are thinking. Um, and I, I can appreciate that. So Sure, absolutely. So it's the, uh, the, the city of brotherly love. I'm sure that people say that and talk to you about that occasionally. Yeah. But anyway, he spent some of his life, or most of your life, I guess, growing up in Africa. Is that correct with your parents? Yeah, I grew up uh, until I was 14 in Gabon, which is the it's a small country on the West Coast, right where the equator hits, just north of Congo and just south of Cameroon and Nigeria. Um, so, And then I spent my high school years in Lexington. That's where uh, I learned to love barbecue. So, Oh, yeah, absolutely. And on and only and a particular type of barbecue. So how did you? So your parents retired from missions at that point and came home, or, or came, went to Lexington and you grew up there, or what? It's a unique story. So on my mom's side, my mom was a missionary kid too. Um, grew up in Cote d'Ivoire, um, but she had four siblings, and her and her four siblings were all missionaries internationally. Um, so uh, when their parents uh, got to be older, um, it became obvious that 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 they they needed to have at least someone around uh, for a caregiver. And so my parents um, decided at that point to move back, and my dad took a church in Lexington, the Christian Missionary Alliance Church there, and yeah, and that's kind of how we came back to the states. They. Um, they were there for seven years and then moved to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, York, PA. And yeah, it's, they, they bounced around. So I, I, I have the prestigious title of being an MK and a PK. There you go. So, um, which means that I'm, I got twice the amount of baggage as most people. So that, that is true. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. And anybody, anybody has been in ministry understands that, uh, there's baggage that comes with ministry when you're raging, raising kids. And, and what the kids have to go through, the student, children have to go through. And so um, my hat's off to you. It's an amazing thing because you're in ministry now. And for, for uh, a child to grow up as an MK and a PK and, and also become a youth pastor for a period of time and to, to do the things you're doing now, that says a lot about uh, how God sustains us and how he is faithful. Yeah. And I believe there is a blessing that goes with pastors' children and uh, and missionaries' children. I think there's a, a special hovering uh, that God does uh, with his angels and with his Holy Spirit taking care of you guys. 
Yeah. My, my children have experienced that too. Yeah, it certainly has been, um, you know, that's that part of, you know, growing up and seeing, you know, my parents weren't perfect like, like all parents, but what I, what I did see is their love for people. And that was um, constant. And that's something that sort of rubbed off on me, I guess. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of think of, you know, that's sort of like our, everyone's calling in life is to love people. Right. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're getting paid from a church or you're getting paid from a bank. Um, you know, if, if you love people, you, you're in ministry, right? I mean. That's right. That's right. So that journey is, um, you know, still uh, playing itself out what that looks like. But yeah, I mean, I do consider it, you know, it was uh, an interesting growing up in the jungles of Africa and then moving to, you know, high school in America was, was not the easiest thing, but you know, I learned a lot. I learned to, to lean on my creator, uh, for, for a lot in those days. And that served me well, um, you know, the rest of my life. So I'm, I am certainly grateful for the parents that I had, and the opportunity I had growing up where I did. Well, catch us up from there, Tim. T tell us where you are today and how you got there. Get us up to present. What's what's happening and how'd you get there? So presently, I'm, um, I'm a director of an international development organization, faith-based, based out of Philadelphia, but we're, we work, do work all over the world. Um, but that journey to that point um, started off as I went to Nyack College, a small uh, Christian Bard school just outside of New York City. Um, now it's all, it's in New York City, actually. Um, went to study youth ministry, um, was there uh, one semester and fell in love with the uh, sociology and the comparative religion uh, major that they had and, and switched majors um, with always the intention of going overseas to do work. Um, so finished up night at college, was looking at grad school and um, got called to work as a part-time camp director, part-time youth pastor in South Central Pennsylvania, just outside of York. Um, if anyone's familiar with that area, um, did that, uh, worked the camp for two summers, realized that that was uh, going to kill me. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, stepped away from that and w ended up going full time at the church, um, as a youth pastor for a year and a year in there was a church split. I got caught in the middle and, um, you know, that was, that's a story for another day, but then ended up going back to the camp in a full time role, um, and did that for six years, um, and at that point, went through the ordination process with the Christian Missionary Alliance and with the goal of heading overseas. Um, and they were starting a new division called Envision, which was focused on next-gen um, ministries. Um, the idea was trying to get them outside of the four walls of the church, specifically involved in missionary work um, in a short-term, medium-term basis. And so they were starting these bases all over the world. And I started the one in Gabon. So I went back to the country I grew up in and um, got that off the ground. It was an incredible experience working with former colleagues of my parents um, and, you know, hearing uh, those stories, things like that. But completely in a role of serving the national church that was there, um, helping them carry out what their vision and dream was for uh, what God wanted them to do. Um, was there three years, um, ended up coming back to the States and started another nonprofit that was working with the, the national church back in Gabon. Did that for two years. And then um, once that was off the ground and running, um, had a desire to do something a little bit bigger than just one country and started what is now Amaveo group with a, the buddy of mine, which was my boss back at CMA when I started with Envision. And we're nine and a half years in and still cooking. So, um, yeah, that's that's in a nutshell. I mean, that was, you know, like I said, there's a lot of stops along that way. But well, when let's do this before we go any farther. How can they get in touch with you? Because one reason that, that you're on here is you want youth pastors and youth workers and, and parents also to know you know, how they can be a part of what you're doing, 
how they can be involved in that sort of thing. So t- how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, just go to amaveogroup.org. So that's A-M-O-V-E-O group, G-R-O-U-P dot org. Um, and that'll have all our information on it. It'll talk about, you know, sort of our ethos, why we exist, um, you know, our values. And one of the things that we focus pretty heavily on, I was talking to you about this, is our is using... Um, short and medium term teams with the stuff that we're doing all over the world. Um, and we have a very specific way that we do that. Um, and yeah, so we welcome, I love to have conversations with youth pastors, youth workers, parents, students about what it looks like to engage uh, with the church in a different culture. Amaveo group.org. And you, um, you and I talked about that. So t- tell us about the places. In fact, last week, we're going to try to get together, but you said, oh, you know what? I'm in Jamaica uh, <laughs> last week. And so then we start talking about these different cities that you're in and what happens and why some of those cities you're not in anymore, which I think is very unique and awesome. So give us a little update. Tell us all the places that you are, have been, and uh, why you're some, some places you're still there and why you're not in other places now. So our... Our focus is always local people, local resources, local solutions, which generally means that the things that we work on are pretty micro in regards to what we do. So I was in Jamaica last week. We're starting work down there with a a deaf school. Um, They have a campus um, and we're working with them to uh, refurbish a building that they're going to use as an apartment that they can rent. Um, So when we talk about local solutions, we're talking about uh, or local resources. We're talking about how do we help these these local ministries generate revenue so that they can do the work of the ministry without needing to get money from the outside, Um, which is, you know, it's that's not the easiest thing to do. But um, so we have when we started off on the veil, we are in El Salvador. So we started and closed a project down there. Um, we still have some things going on in Haiti, but that one is wrapping up. Uh, we started and closed a project in Cambodia. Um, and now we are in, uh, just south of Ensenada, Mexico. We have projects here in Philadelphia where our home base is. We have projects in Dublin. We have projects in Burkina Faso, which is in West Africa. And we're starting things off in Jamaica. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, again, there's the rhyme or reason I think gets lost sometimes on people in regards to why we, we do certain things. But as I was sharing with you, it's very, um, you know, it's all designed around finding a person of peace in a community that we can develop a trust relationship with that then we can begin to work with. And I, th- I think that's just a unique way to say that. I've never heard any organization say that they may, and they may be looking for that, but that person of peace uh, phrase is just like, it's like soothing yeah, to hear that you're looking for a person of peace. The other thing I wanted to, to, to say before we just pass over it was I, I wanted them to hear that you're not in these places and doing a project and just dumping them. What you're doing is you're finishing a project so that they're self-sufficient to go on without you. That's, that's a huge thing, and that is one of your purposes, and I think it's very unique. But talk about this person of peace. How did you come up with calling them that? Well, there's, I mean, it's actually a word that's been used um, in in circles when when you're talking about evangelism with Muslims. Um, But the idea, there's actually a biblical reference to it in the Bible about going into a village or to a community and finding someone that welcomes you. Um, And, you know, Jesus talked about you know, if you find that person, you can stay there and, you know, basically tell them, you know, tell your story. But if, if not, you dust your sandals on, you go on to the next village, right? Um, right so that right. person of peace concept is basically that idea. And and they exist all over the world and every community, um, every neighborhood, every village. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're the, you know, uh, one of the mamas. Um, that, you know, is running a a preschool or it's, uh, you know, a chief of a village or it's a local pastor or it's a a doctor or it's a, you know, in this case in in Jamaica, it's a gentleman that actually grew up in the U.S. um, 
uh, as a worked as um, as a um, a chef in New York City. Um, was deaf himself um, and ended up down in Jamaica, and now he runs the operations for that school. Um, wow, you know, and and those things happen through. You know, you know, the world might call it chance engagements, um, but normally what happens is is we get introduced to that person, we have a conversation, and you know, it just it kind of rolls from there. And and ultimately, um, you know, the more you meet of these people, the quicker it is to identify um, who they are. And it's hard to kind of explain, you know, exactly what it is, but it's sort of like just you know, you know pretty quick that, Hey, listen, this is, this is someone we can trust. This is someone we can listen to someone who is willing to trust us to be honest. Um, and we, you know, we end up working with them. Um, and that leads to, again, the, the, the local solution doesn't, isn't the same thing everywhere. You know, I mentioned we're in Dublin in Ireland. Well, that means, you know, that's totally different than what it looks like in Leogan, Haiti, you know, that's just been ravaged by a, a, an earthquake. Right. Um, so, but, you know, the process is, is the same in that regards. Well, tell me about Dublin, because Dublin, once again, when, when we think about missions like this, we think of Africa, we think of Haiti, we think of, of Mexico and some of the places that you're talking about. I've been and, and I've been to Dublin. And so what was that person of peace like? Since that's kind of unique to, I mean, we do think of missions in, in different places like that. Ukraine, yeah. where horrible things are happening and, you know, and in, in, in France where, you know, or, or wherever. But um, what's what was that person of peace like in Dublin? Just out of curiosity. Well, so it started with a you know that that scenario was a, was a little bit unique in that we ran into a couple that um, went on a vacation to Dublin and felt like God was calling them there, and they had um, they were. I don't know, middle, middle age. So they, they had, they were both professionals. They had a full blown family. Um, and so they, you know, they said, Hey, listen, we want to go to Ireland or Dublin. And we said, well, we'll help you get there. This is how we do it. Um, they said, sure. And so, um, we placed them on the ground and then they were the ones that developed those, those connections with the person of peace. So, this particular uh, staff family works heavily in substance abuse, um, and there's a ministry there that's similar to teen, well, it's teen Challenge here in the U.S. Um, she was a professional counselor, um, and he ended up uh, getting a job at, at one, of a, one of the local evangelical church. I think there's 20 of them in Dublin. Um, you know, what people don't know about the nation of Ireland, and it's... it's uh, uh, one of the least reached countries in Europe. Um, the debate of whether it is the least reached or not is up for grabs. But because of the the you know the culture wars that went on there with the Catholic and Protestant churches, no no one wants anything to do with religion there. Um, and of course, we're not ta- we're not talking about religion, but they don't you know they don't perceive that. So um, so in that particular case, uh, they're they're working with. Um, a ministry that has a, uh, it's an 18 month program for women an 18 month program for men. Um, and, and they work with that and they, they do retreats with them. Um, she's a counselor, um, and they, they work with that ministry. So, um, and then we have another couple there too, who, this is another unique story. So when we took the first couple over there and, and tell me if this is getting too long, um, but you know, we were trying to, we're trying to find people, when we go into a new area, and, and this maybe might have been the person of peace that we found with a guy named Ken Hanning that was a pastor at a vineyard church. And we literally did a Google search, found him, and we went to, we showed up the church that Sunday, and um, he took us out to lunch, and the rest is history. Um, in regard, now he's on, he's one of part of our executive team. He leads uh, the, our focus in Europe, um, things like that. So, you know, when we talk about persons of peace in, in Dublin, it looks a little bit different than um, the pastor in Leogan, Haiti, that, that we ran into and basically ended up living on his compound with his family. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very different, but the idea is still the same, which is that finding, you know, local people who 
um, if they had local resources, they're going to come up with local solutions. And it's not something that we discover for them or tell them what to do or, you know, sort of impose any kind of will. It, you know, it, it really is following their lead and then working to empower them. Um, and it's, you know, it sounds simple. It's not, it's never that simple, but the concept and the methodology actually is pretty simple as long as you keep it as your North star. Right. Yeah. And that, that, that is, uh, it does sound simple, but I know ministry and ministry, <laughs> there is no ministry that is simple, no matter how well you put it together. There, there's always, uh, because you're dealing with spiritual warfare, you're dealing with all kinds of things like that. Let, let's go back in time a little bit. Let's go back because we're dealing, these are some of the questions I ask because I want people to get a feel for the uniqueness of, of people's lives being in people's lives, especially in adolescence. And so I told you I was going to ask you this. Is there, is there some person in your adolescent between, you know, middle school, high school, college, that one person, other than your parents, your parents sound like amazing people. But uh, we like to go, was there some outsider, uh, whether it was a coach, teacher, uh, youth worker, pastor, anybody, um, maybe it's another relative, but just spoken to your life somewhere and you had that kind of like an aha moment, or, or maybe you look back on that and go, that was where all this really began for me. Is there any person like that in your life? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as... Uh, one of the challenges of being a missionary kid is is we went to boarding school. Um, you know, and this is the this is one of the really hard parts of my childhood and life was that at six years old I was dropped off at a boarding school, and you know my parents drove down the road. Um, and so first through eighth grade, I spent um, you know the majority of my life at a boarding school, a missionary kid school, and. Um, it was at, so uh, in Gabon, you'd go to elementary school in Gabon, and then middle school you'd go to in Cote d'Ivoire. There's a larger school than middle school and high school. So at the end, my sixth, my my fifth and sixth grade year, and I, I consider that middle school. Maybe that's a little earlier, but... No, it is. Sixth grade. I, I had, I had a, 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 a dorm father named Gene Talbot, and I'll never forget, because he, um, you know, he... Up until that point, they would always just take a missionary and put him in the in the dorm because it was a smaller school, and this was the first time they had someone come out specifically a dorm father, and he was just you know <laughs> incredibly fast, fun, middle aged man that just like his whole goal was to was to for for our lives to be fun, um, and that I mean he would plan stuff, games for us to play after school, he would. You know, we do popcorn and pop nights. We do all kinds of stuff. But one of the things that um, I am forever indebted to him is that he mentored me spiritually. And he is the, you know, those, that fifth and sixth grade years were the times that I, I really began to develop my relationship with the, you know, the God of the universe. And it was because of his encouragement and mentoring that wasn't anything it wasn't rocket science it wasn't like you know bible school he, he had never gone to seminary i don't think he'd ever gone to bible college to be honest um he was a carpenter actually um which that was one of the things he was just a and he just invested in me man it, it, and i am forever grateful uh, for that because it was formative years and it wasn't just the spiritual side of things too it was also the emotional side right i mean right um and uh, for me, that is something that, you know, I'll always, I'll always be grateful to, to Gene Talbot for his investment in my life at that point. And how, how old were you when you asked Christ into your heart? That was, uh, I was five. So that was pre-boarding uh, school. Yeah, um, yeah. I was in kindergarten. So, and, it, and my mom, uh, was, it was with my mom. Now that's that's very uh, very interesting, and uh, my three children, the, between the ages of about uh, four and seven, I believe it was, they came to know Christ at different times in different ways that I didn't see coming, and uh, and uh, which was very unique to their story and to our lives, and you know uh, I think the Holy Spirit moments are Holy Spirit moments when God interjects Himself into you. Yeah, we don't. We don't own those things, right? Right, we don't. We don't. 
I always thought, well, the perfect time is middle school. Let them come to know Jesus in middle school. I, God had another idea. So that is really cool. And it's very cool, I think, that those things started that he poured himself into you at that age. Yeah. I believe the most important time for youth workers is middle school. Now, I loved working with high schoolers. I wor- loved working with college students. But middle school are is the most creative time in their life. There's something that God is doing in there. It's the craziest time for parents and them going, oh, they're so crazy, whatever. But the but it's those moments in middle school, uh, what I tell people, and I've had others confirm this who work with them, is that middle schoolers, if, you, if they're your friend in middle school as an adult to a middle schooler working with them, they're your friend for life. If they're... If you aren't and you get on the bad side of them, they may be your enemies for life, you know, but it's that middle school thing going on there. So that is very unique. Now, let's go on to, um, tell me, is there anything else that you want to tell us about your ministry before we go on with any of this? You know, I think that just going back to the, something you touched on earlier. Um, so the guy that started Amaveo with me, a guy named Matt Peace, who's actually my boss when I worked at CMA, um, but we have always believed that an investment in the next gen or next, what we call next gen ministries. So students and college students um, was going to be part of who we were and what we did it, you know, and that's not necessarily a, you know, a, it's not a theology. It's not a methodology. It's just that, Hey, we like those people. And we believe that we want them to be part of what we're doing. And so that means that when we cr- when we recruit our staff um, that are working at our projects around the world, it's always part of the conversation of, "Hey, listen, you got to be cool with uh, high school and middle school students showing up and and hanging out with you for a week, and you know, we and college kids who are maybe trying to figure stuff out, showing up for three, six, twelve months." Yeah. And doing life with you. It's part of what we talk about. And it's just part of our, you know, I, I, I use the term ethos because it's kind of in our bones. It's not necessarily something that we would say is a value, right? It's just something that exuberates from what we are. So um, if you go to our website, you see that's one of the things that we are pretty, you know, it's designed around trying to make sure people understand that we really welcome that. We want them to be part of that. Um but that would be the, you know, the main thing. Um, if, if anyone ever has any questions about that, you know, one of the things that we try to do and are very intentional about in, is when, if you, sh- if you were to show up with your, like, your high school or college team or, or middle schoolers, is, you know, you're not going to paint the same wall that the team did the week before. Um, uh, you know, and I, I'm not, I mean, we've all heard, all of us have heard those horror stories. I heard one youth pastor I was talking to said that they, they had them using rocks scratching on the side of a concrete wall so they could prep the wall for paint for the following team. Well, you know, of course he was like, really? That's what, but the point is, is that we coach our, our staff and our locations to make sure that what you do is strategic and part of a, a bigger plan in regards to what's going on on the ground, whether that's, you know, relational connections with our ministry partners, whether that's, um, you know, like this team that we're going to take to Jamaica in September is going to, this is an adult team, but they're going to help refurbish this apartment. But we have a bunch of students going to Mexico this summer and they're working at a boy's home and they're going to be planting king palm trees because in five years, they can sell those things for 10 times the amount of money that they cost to plant them. So, you know, things like that, it's creative. Um, and I always tell people that it's just lazy. If, if you're having people do stuff to do stuff, then that's lazy. Um, and, and we got to figure out a better way. So anyways, that would be a little bit of insight into um, how we do that, how people connect, things like that. So, Well, Tim, give me, uh, people relate best with our best, uh, our worst, <laughs> first, our worst moments of ministry, and, and then our best. Uh, so let's, let's go on a little bit of both of those things. So give me your worst ministry moment that you can share. I, I, I talked a little bit about it, but um, my, um, I just got out of college, Bible college. I was I was in this church and it was just starting to take off and, and there was this split that happened. Um, you know, so I'm a 
23 year old kid who is trying to do the right thing and trying to figure out, you know, like where, how do I follow God in this situation? Right. Cause it, it is a war of men at that point. All of us or some of us have been through those situations and it is, it does oftentimes become a war of men, not anything that, you know, God wants anything to do with. And it was really hard. And, um, you know, I felt like I had, uh, my my duty is not the right word, but to to honor God was to honor the servant that He had put in place, which was the senior pastor. Um, and ultimately, that senior pastor got removed um, by a district authority, not by the church, because of the elders asking for that. Well, the problem was is I because I was supporting the pastor when he left, I was left with you know sort of sitting there looking at everyone and the and they're just like, uh, what are you doing here? Um, you know, even though I had no to some level no skin in the game, right? So you you know friendly friendly fire and um, you know he, th- this may be the best part about it. There was one of the elders um, that I was close to. Basically, he came up to me and he said, "Hey, listen, you know." It, you have an opportunity to go back to the camp. It probably makes sense for you not to hang around here, just to hang around. Um, you know, which that was really hard for me to hear because, um, you know, it, you, no one likes someone to tell you, Hey, I think you need to leave. Right. right, right. Um, but here's what I will say about that elder. Um, when I went to the mission field, he was by far one of my biggest supporters. Wow. Um, so you talk about keeping, you know, he, he had skin in the game, right? Um, and that is something for me that I'll always remember. Um, good guy. Uh, so, you know, even though it was a really terrible situation, there were things that came out of that that were beautiful. And that was for me, one of those I'll always remember. Um, I don't know. Does that qualify for oh, a yeah. terrible ministry oh, situation? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I wish I wish you were the only guy who went through that kind of pain. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's more, it's more common than not. Uh, in in churches around the world, and so uh, tell tell me about your best ministry moment. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I was I was thinking about that after you you said, "Hey, I'm going to ask you that question." Um, and it you know it goes through kind of like you know what I was talking about. Like we have this sort of methodology of like this is what we want to do, and um, and you know. Uh, Here's a here's a little secret. It doesn't always work, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Um, right. But right. in one particular case, um, you know, and I'm sure there's probably millions of these. But in one particular case, especially in Haiti, um, one of the things that was identified was that there was 19, 20, 21 year old men that um, had basically gone through the, the the school system there, and there was no jobs for them, and they were just sitting around trying to figure out what to do. Um, and so, uh, our team down there identified that, uh, you know, Hey, why don't we start a a carpentry, uh, company? Um, and so they started this thing called union shop and basically, um, to this day employs five of these young men that do specialty carpentry. Um, you know, so for, and they make a living doing it. Right. Um, so, Again, not necessarily, you know, these beautiful glory hallelujah moments, but the reality was that that solution, which was identified by our person of peace down there, um, Jean, a guy named Jean, that was a pastor, good old, good dude. Um, you know, it started in the, his compound. Um, that's where they had all their stuff. Um, and, you know, to this day, it's, it's still, it's still operating. And for me, that's a, you know, uh, that's a success. Now, did we have 500 of these people employed and did we have businesses all over the island popping up? No. But you know what? For those five men, it was a big deal. Yes. And that changed their lives forever and the lives of their future wives and their children and their children. Um, and so for me, I look at stuff like that and, and that is a, that's a highlight because, um, you know, that, that, that is really hard to do. Those, um, you know, those successes aren't always as easy as you want them to be, especially in those contexts and what they were dealing with. And so that for me would be a highlight I would point to, you know, I have 
probably like a, I don't know, 50 stories like that that I could tell. But that one always stands out to me because of, I mean, the country of Haiti is one of the hardest places I have ever been in my life. Um, and I've been all over Africa, but I've never been in a place that, that is as hard as Haiti was. Well, which, which is so interesting. I've been to the Dominican Republic and, and the Dominican Republic and, and Haiti, same island, same island divided and uh they do not like to um coexist together no no there's yeah there's some huge i mean that's a there's some big issues with that um you know i mean we we see it all the time you know in our country we see it all over the i see it all over the world um you know i call it racism if i'm honest uh is what it is it's you know, it's a bias towards some of, someone of a different race. And, um, you know, the Haitians, I mean, it's crazy. I've crossed that border a couple times um, by car. Um, and it is amazing to me, the not only the infrastructure and the economic component you see, but also the geographic uh, things that you see. Going from brown to green is, is you know, was shocking to me. But yeah, I mean, that is, that's, that's one of the sad, sad stories of, of, you know, of this world that we live in. So yeah, and indeed. And we're from America. If you go to the Dominican Republic, you're going, you're thinking, well, man, I'm really working in poverty and dealing with poverty. Then you go over to Haiti and you go, wait a minute, how did that happen? You know? Yeah. And so how could it be worse? But, but it is. It, I mean, I, p- poverty is different in every community you're in, right? It's it is. not just physical. Um, some of it's spiritual, some of it's emotional. You know, the big thing I would say in Haiti is just the opportunity. Um, I've never met people that work harder. Um, I've never met people that are, that are, that are as creative. Um, you know, they're incredible people. They, it's just, it boils down to opportunity. Um, and you know that I believe that that will happen someday in the country of Haiti. I really do believe that. Tell me uh, some things that you'd like people to know that they don't know about you. What What do you do that? I mean, uh, you know, you're you're a real person like everybody else. What is fun for you? Do you do some things that almost nobody knows about, but you just love doing in your life? Well, I'm a huge soccer fan. So uh, I mean, obviously, growing up overseas, and it, I mean, I'd probably um, I play it a couple times a week, um, and I follow it religiously. So I don't know. I mean, it's, I would say it's like my, my only hobby, if that could be a hobby. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm a big Arsenal fan. It's, if you follow the British Premier League, they're on top of the table right now. Um, they which is, you know, it's the equivalent of, of having had a team that was really good 20 years ago. And then the last 10 years have been awful. And now they're back on top. So um, there's that's that's a simple thing. Um, I'm married to a, a Dutch lady, so um, I shared with you earlier. Uh, you know, I went through a really sad time in my life where I was I my my first marriage ended up in a divorce. Um, was on the was on the mission field when it happened. Really hard situation, um, but. Um, you know, God in his infinite mercy provided, uh, Maddie to me, uh, in a very most unusual circumstance. Um, I know you're going to, I don't know if this is a good time to tell the story, but. No, sure it is. Because I was going to tell you about your love story. That's right. Everybody loves a good love story. And the Bible is full of love stories and hard stories. We'll say this in context of what you're saying. There's several of the people, multiples of the people that I've interviewed that have gone through divorces. And, uh, and ministry, unfortunately, is a peppered with divorce like almost anything else in this world. And so, uh, but your love story is unique as well uh, throughout all of that. So yeah, to tell us what you want to tell us about all that. Well, I, you know, I always say it's a bit of a story of redemption um, because, you know, there, the thing is, is, um, you know, that when I went through divorce, it was something I, I had, I did not know, I did not know was coming, right? Um, it was one of those situations that was sort of out of the blue. Now, uh, in hindsight, and having gone through a lot of counseling and done a lot of work on myself, I, 
I should have known it was coming. Um, and so I take, you know, here's what I would say. Um, I take uh, responsi- as much responsibility for that as um, uh, in that, for that situation for what happened. Um, but it happened. And I was, you know, sort of wandering a- after that. We, I had to, you know, left the mission field, come back to the States, was trying to figure out what's going on sort of work with this nonprofit um, and then um, had to move to Philadelphia because I needed to be near a, a, a major airport. I was, you know, I had moved in, was living in my sister's basement as a 35 year old, not, you know, not the most glamorous thing that you want to think about. But anyways, uh, lived there for a year when I moved back from Africa, then moved to Philly and ended up at a vineyard church um, in a little town called Media because I, I had met a, a young couple uh, while working in Gabon, they'd come out and help me uh, in a short-term stint for about four months with our intern program. And they had moved to Philly. And so I was like, I I really like them. I'm going to move to Philly. Um, and they were going to this church. So started going to that church and um, been there about a year or so and was in, uh, was in our small group. And we had broken up guys and girls um, and doing our prayer time at that point. And I just... Um, I was getting some prayer and I just sensed that, Hey, listen, like it's time for, you know, for you to like start being open to another relationship. Um, and, uh, I had dinner the next night with my sister and told her that. And, and she was like, yeah, I think it's, I think, you know, I think you are ready. And Sunday I sat down in church and I thought it was the purse of the wife of my best friend. And it was Maddie's purse. She had gone to the bathroom and came back. And she's like, who's that strange man sitting in my seat? You know? <laughs> so she comes in and it was, it was love at first sight for me. Um, and uh, long story short, she uh, was, she, she produced documentaries for the Dutch Evangelical Broadcasting Company. And she was shooting a documentary in Jersey. But earlier in her life, she had, she had, um, she had nannied in Boston area and one of her best friends had led her to the Lord, went to Gordon. Um, and she lived in this area. So every summer she'd come back and, you know, hang out with the family. Um, and then she would go to this vineyard church. And so that's why she was there. She she was shooting a a documentary and, and this was in end of January sits down beside me. The pastor comes down, knows both of us. Um, you know, he knows my story. He knows her story at this, you know, and, um, he's like, let's go out to lunch. So we, we went out to lunch. Uh, you know, she's flying out to Holland the next day to Amsterdam. And I'm like trying to figure out, okay, what I like, you know, the next time I'm going to see her is this summer. That's six months away. I got to figure out now if I want to, I want to do anything. So, but, um, so we have lunch, you know, whatever it, it goes good. Uh, you know, I'm still trying to figure out, I try to give her my business card because that's the only thing I was like, how do I get my, get her information, which is completely, you know, moronish. Right. Um, and so long story short, it was Super Bowl Sunday. Um, but her best friend's birthday was having a birthday party. So she wasn't able to come to, to anything we were doing with the Super Bowl. Um, so, uh, I ended up at my friend's house. We're watching the Super Bowl, and his wife gets this email from Maddie. So the party that she was at got it was was sort of a fake party because the husband was taking her friend away for a surprise thing. So she's like, "I have nothing to do. Can I come over and watch a Super Bowl with you?" So we ended up at the same Super Bowl party, um, and you know we hung out again. Uh, but my roommate was there, the the guy that was roommate, and and they were like hitting it off because I was sitting there trying to figure out like, oh, what do I do? Like, is this someone, you know, she's not going to be here for six months. Do I really want to? So I'm just, I'm basically just like people watching this whole time. And finally I get up the nerve, you know, that the end of the Super Bowl, that was the Super Bowl, the Giants won on that Eli Manning, like crazy pass. They beat the uh, New England Patriots. But I thought, so I follow her out their car and I'm like, hey, listen, I know you're going back to Holland tomorrow, but you know, why don't you go grab a cup of coffee with me? So, you know, this is like 11 o'clock at night. She's met me a couple times and we basically go out to a, a 24 hour diner, sit down, drink coffee. And, um, you know, just again, just shared some pretty, you know, both of our lives had been pretty hard to be honest. And, um, 
sparks flew. I, you know, I basically said, well, we should stay in touch. And I, uh, the next night I had a soccer, soccer game and I went out to grab some food with, with my friends afterwards. And one of the, the two of the guys had met her because they were at the Super Bowl party. The other guy was like, who's this gal that you're talking about? I was like, don't worry, you'll meet her at my wedding. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so we had, we did sort of this long distance thing, but I was at that point flying back and forth to Africa for, with the nonprofit. And um, so I popped off in on the way back, on the way back from Africa, popped off and spent some time with her. Um, she was shooting a documentary in Bolivia at that point. So, when I get to Holland, her mom, who I've never met, actually picks me up. You know, she, her mom doesn't really speak English. Oh, wow. um, so, uh, and then she came stateside, met my family. I got the blessing from my dad. And the following week, I asked her to marry me. And then she moved here in July. And we were married in September. Um, and that was 10 years ago. Wow. Um, married in October. 10 years ago, October. Um yeah. And in that process, we've adopted three children. Uh, and as, as, um, as teenagers, and now we're empty nesters. So it's been sort of like a whirlwind tour, uh, in that regards. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot more to that story, but, um, the the path of redemption for both of us and finding each other and how that happened and just the mir the miracle of it happening really you know um is yeah it's nothing nothing short of a miracle that you know we recognize every day so well you know we wouldn't expect anything less from god uh with the people that he loves and people that have given their lives to serve you know I, i've told my children too you know you're you're a minister whether you are being paid to do it or not. Yeah. And and I would tell that to my volunteer staff as well. And the same, but the deal is that God, uh, God does intervene. God does uh, pull the pictures together. If we look at Moses' life, we look at uh, Paul's life, we look at different ones, and God has a way of, of bringing, uh, even though life is painful, all of life is painful, he has ways of bringing peace and joy in the middle of all that. And uh, it sounds like that's what he's done with you yeah, and uh, with Maddie. So just congratulations on all that and that whirlwind uh, 10 years. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> it has been a whirlwind for sure. Well, listen, I'm going to let you go tonight. Uh, I, unless there's anything else that you want to say to, to youth workers or, or anyone who's listening here, because there's going to be a lot more people other than youth workers listening to that tim anything else you want to say at all yeah i mean i guess i would just you know those people that are working with um teenagers um in next gen ministries like i get that it is a it's exhausting it's it's because it's um you know the majority of us are in a volunteer role um which means that we're working a full-time gig somewhere else and then we go on a retreat and we have to stay up till like two in the morning and then somehow get up you know monday and go to work exactly um but you know the the thing about that is um those those students those people that you're investing in will, are never going to forget that 2 a.m you know pillow fight that you had um and and the most important thing about that is is just being real with them, right? I mean, they they can read through stuff anyways, but it's in those 2 a.m. pillow fights time that you can actually, you know, talk to them about real stuff that happened in your life. You know, it's hard to do that sometimes when at youth group night when everyone's around and you're doing certain things. So just take advantage of those moments that you have that are off the beaten path that aren't necessarily, you know, youth group night or stuff that you've organized or just take advantage of those moments and be honest and real with them. Uh, you know, talk about the, the pain, um, as much as the, the, the joys that goes with that. Um, and you are the, you know, let's face it. You are the heroes in that regards because you are doing exhausting work. So keep it up. That is a great word to, to close out on Tim. Listen, buddy, I, I appreciate you so much for reaching out. Absolutely. Uh, to Youth Worker on Fire. And I know you've 
uh, communicate somewhat with my son who edits this as well as, as uh, myself. And uh, thank you for your work. Thanks for not giving up on God. Thanks for not giving up through the pain that you've lived in, the, in this world and in life. And uh, thank God for blessing the, the missionary pastor's kid that you were to be the, the missionary and pastor that you are. I appreciate that. Absolutely. My uh, prayers are, are with you and for you. Tim, don't be a stranger. Reach out uh, anytime. Absolutely. And uh, we'll see uh, what God does through this podcast, through your episode to engage people with your ministry. Awesome. I appreciate it so much. Lord bless you. You've been listening to the Youth Worker on Fire podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and tell your friends. Also, leave a comment and tell us what you think. Stay tuned for more informative episodes.